This is a sports catastrophe production. Hey there, hello there, hello there. Jeff Cutter Dover welcome you to another sports catastrophe on this day. And on this day, July the 5th, 1975, Arthur Ashe set a precedent for black athletes everywhere by winning Wimbledon. Now, Arthur Ashe was a pretty good tennis player, but he was more known for his education after he had a health issue. Well, he's, he's, he died at age 49 in 1993, but basically, you know, Arthur basically was a good tennis player. But, of course, you know, Ash had troubles because, you know, of the fact that, you know, he was black and feeling towards black players. Wasn't really that good back in the day. So anyway, Ash learned about racial equality and all that. Basically, he was a legendary player and all that. He was actually a second lieutenant in the general corps in the U.S. military, so that's pretty good. He was actually picked for the U.S. Davis Cup team in 1965, and he would win the NCAA singles title with UCLA. He went to the Australian Championship, lost to Roy Emerson. But Arthur Ashe ended up winning the Open, the U.S. Open, the first time the U.S. Championships were open to like professionals and all that. He won the amateur title, but he won the, the Open National Championship, which was good and all that. Ashe was actually required to maintain his amateur status because of his Davis Cup eligibility and his time away from Army duty. He couldn't accept the first prize money, which was $14,000, which was given to Tom Odker. So anyway, Arthur Ashe would help the U.S. team do well in the Davis Cup and all that. So anyway, Arthur Ashe was a legendary player. But in 1975, it was one of the most keyed up um, Wimbledons of all time. Jimmy Connors was the number one um, player heading into the 1975 Wimbledon stuff, and he easily took care of his four opponents, including John Lloyd of England, who married Chris Everett at one time. He would be joined in the quarterfinals by Raul Ramirez of Mexico, Guillermo Filas of Argentina, Roscoe Tanner of the United States after Nastasi was taken out surprisingly in the second round by Sherwood Stewart. Arthur Ashe was in the bottom half of the draw, ranked number six. He would take care of South Africa's Bob Hewitt. Japan's Jay Kamawasumi, American Bob Godfrey, and British qualifier Greg Stowell. Bjorn Borg, who was seeded number three, oh, was in the quarterfinals as well, alongside Tom Odker, the guy who ironically had that got the thirteen thousand dollar check because Arthur Ashe couldn't take it because he was an amateur. And surprisingly. Not Ken Rosewall, who was one of the best players ever from Australia. It was Anthony Roche. So, so good times for all. Connors would beat Raul Ramirez in three sets. Roscoe Tanner would shock Vilas and get to the semis against Connors, who easily beat Roscoe Tanner. Ash would take on Bjorn Borg in the quarterfinals of 75 and actually beat Borg winning the last three sets in succession. He would have to deal with Tony Roche, who actually beat Tom Otker in five sets. Ash would have a tough five-setter himself, but he would 
beat Roche to get to the final against one Jimmy Connors. Connors looked good, but Ash had his number. First two sets were 6-1, 6-1. So basically, Connors was up against it. He won the third set, but Ash would win the fourth set and win one for racial equality. In fact, that 1975 Wimbledon final was the first All-American final since 1947. Ash had his ninth attempt to win Wimbledon, and he did it. It was amazing. Connors had not dropped a set at Wimbledon, but Ash basically played tactical tennis and did it. So, anyway. Yeah. Actually, Jimmy Connors had a libel suit against Arthur Ashe, and who was president of the ATP at the time. But thanks to Arthur Ashe symbolically wearing his Davis Cup warm-up jacket, on center court. Connors dropped the suit. Ash would basically retire in 1980 following heart surgery, all that, winning 51 titles. He's only one of two men of black African ancestry to win a Grand Slam singles title. Yannick Noah of France won the French Open in 1983. He was, you know, the other guy, too. Arthur Ashe would be, would take on many roles. He, he would commentate for ABC Sports for a while. And was captain of the U.S. Davis Cup team from 81 to 85. He actually published a three-volume book called The Hard Road to Glory, The History of the African-American Athlete. And Ashe would say that the book was more important than any tennis titles. And, and Arthur Ashe would, appeared in Ken Burns' 1994 baseball documentary, you know, baseball, discussing Jackie Robinson's impact on the game. Of course, he was a civil rights supporter who wanted to head to South Africa to observe political change in the country as it approached racial integration. All that. Personal life. He met a photographer. G Jean Montabasi, Montuzumi, who is actually of African American heritage. They were married in the in New York City, and they adopted a daughter named Camera. Ash suffered a heart attack in 1979, and his condition actually drew attention to the hereditary aspect of heart disease because you know his mother already had cardiovascular disease at the time of her death, and, her, and his father suffered a couple of heart attacks. It was ca cardiac catheterization. No, I said that one of Arthur Ashe's arteries was closed, and another was 95% closed. He went through a quadruple bypass operation in 1979. So basically, he became the national campaign chairman for the American Heart Association. And after being paralyzed with something in his right arm in 1988, doctors discovered he had a parasitic disease which was found in people infected with HIV or toxoplasmosis. It was HIV positive. And basically... He knew he contracted the virus from blood transfusions during his heart surgery. So basically, he did, it was not about the homosexuality thing, but, you know, HIV was still the gay people's disease and all that at the time. Arthur Ashe in 1992 actually finally decided to publicly announce he had HIV four years after he was diagnosed with it. He actually blamed USA Today for for forcing him to go public with the dudes, but he didn't want to lie about his illness and all that. Well, after he said that, USA Today got a lot of backlash. After Ash went public with his illness, he formed the Foundation for the Defeat of AIDS to raise awareness about the virus and advocated teaching sex education and safe sex and all that. 
and basically fields questions about the fact that the misconception that only homosexual, bisexual, and bisexual men or basically IV drug users were risk at HIV, all that. It was shocking, all that. He was actually named Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. And then he would write his memoir, Days of Grace, finishing the manuscript a week before his death. Unfortunately, he would die of AIDS-related pneumonia in a New York hospital February 6, 1993. It was shocking and all that. That a great guy like Arthur Ashe would die so soon after his conditions and all that. He's still one of the greatest athletes around. And he is an icon for many people, for the African-American community and for the HIV community. Kind of like Magic Johnson, but basically Arthur Ashe was trying to make the world a better place. And in a sense, he tried. And that's good enough for me. Anyway, I'm Jeff Diamond. I do.